good morning everyone good morning and uh, welcome to today's class uh, we'll pray and we'll get started so would one of us from the classroom here lead in prayer lord uh, we thank you for this day oh father we thank you for your grace we thank you for your lord lord uh, as we're going to start our classes oh lord father we submit our minds we submit our hearts uh, into your hands oh lord help us to understand oh lord father help us uh, to receive give us a heart oh lord father to receive to understand everything that you are teaching us today and lord uh, let what you are teaching oh lord father we pray that it will fall on the good ground oh father for your glory uh, in jesus name we pray amen Amen. Amen. So let's start with a quick recap of Acts 13. So if you all can tell me what are some of the things that happened in Acts 13, we'll proceed from there. Correct. How do they, how are they, uh, how are they deciding on, on this missionary journey? Why? Why are they going on missionary journey? Correct. When they were praying, Holy Spirit spoke and said, set aside for me. Paul and Barnabas for the ministry for which I've called them. Then they start the journey. Um, they go to which place first? Cyprus. Correct. They go to Cyprus. It's an island. They go there. From there, they travel through sea and go into the region of Gal Galatia, Galatia region. And over there, they minister in a place called Antioch. Antioch of Pisidia. Okay, Pisidia. And in this place, the ministry went on well. They first go to the synagogue. Correct. They go to the synagogue and whatever they are sharing is very interesting for the listeners. What they share is uh, so intriguing that the Gentiles ask for them to come on a Sabbath and preach about Christ. So they do that. And the entire city, it says, lots of people from the city, they came. They heard what Paul and Barnabas had to preach. And uh, we also saw that the Jews became jealous. Okay. Uh, and uh, they started opposing Paul and Barnabas. They expelled them out of Antioch, which is why now they have to move on to other places. So they come to a place called as Iconium. Okay, Paphos is before. We missed about Paphos. So they go to a place called Paphos also. And what happens there? Who is there? Sorcerer. But sorcerer is uh, preventing a preconcil, proconcil from understanding the gospel. Who is that person? Sergius Paulus. Correct. So he is not able to receive the gospel. And we said that there's always an element of spiritual warfare. So when Paul comes in, um, steps in, and he rebukes, you know, that evil in the sorcerer, the sorcerer goes blind for some period of time. But one good thing is that this uh, hindering spirit is restrained, and Sergius Paulus is amazed by the teachings. Okay? Those are the things that we understood. So now... We will move on to chapter 14. And we are continuing to look at the first missionary journey. So as we have stated earlier, it is from AD 46 to AD 48. Let me quickly show us the map once again so that it registers in our minds. And then we will continue talking.
excuse me yeah so as we can see once again we have the map of paul and barnabas's first missionary journey as we look at it carefully the path that they follow from antioch to cyprus salamis paphos and then going on to perga what happened in perga they reached perga and something happened yeah barnabas stayed and uh, paul also they both were there yeah john mark left so that is something we have to remember acts 13 that's where he left okay perga is where he left from perga we went on to antioch of pisidia from there to right now we are at iconium so we'll see all the things that happen at iconium and later on lystra and then later on derby and see how from derby they are coming back along the same route so they'll go to lystra iconium antioch and then back of course atalia and then they will not go to cyprus they'll just continue on back to antioch so this is what the first missionary journey is like and it's roughly for 2 years ad 46 to ad 48 okay so i think now we have a uh, it's registering slowly so let's look at the different things that take place in iconium so we'll go back to the text of acts chapter 14 and from the beginning we'll start to see what is happening here so from verses 1 to 5 um they come to this place called as iconium but then iconium derby lystra are like uh, tri cities they are important because they are what is known as galatia and later on paul writes an epistle to the galatians when he writes to the galatians he is writing to the believers in these three cities okay so that's that's what we must remember and why is this galatia region important there is one more significant fact about it that the next generation leaders some of them connected with paul from these places so timothy is from lystra so that's that's the significance of lystra okay uh, you have other names also gaius is another person whom um, paul chose and these people became part of the leadership team of paul so that is another significant fact regarding the galatia region so now when he comes to iconium what are the things that happen could someone quickly go through verses uh, 1 to 5 let's see the kind of response that paul and barnabas are getting the chapter 14 1 to 5 yes and it came to pass in iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the jews and so spake that a great multitude both of jews and also of the greeks believed but the unbelieving jews stirred up the gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the lord which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands but the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the jews and part with the apostles and when there was an assault made both of the gentiles and also of the jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them so there is a poor response you could say or rising opposition to paul and barnabas and their ministry they already faced it in antioch again in iconium as they go to the synagogue as they speak there are people who are being stirred up and who is doing the stirring up jews unbelieving jews stirring up the gentiles and you know it says poisoning their minds so obviously they must have planted evil and deceptive thoughts and said that this is not correct don't listen to them and therefore 
there is opposition, but also we notice that there's some sort of a division. Some are believing, whereas some are not believing. So anyway, they decided that they cannot continue the ministry here. They move on to the next place, which is Lystra. So they come to Lystra and they are preaching the gospel there. So in Lystra, there is a notable miracle that takes place. In verse 8, it says, Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet, was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. So have we, have we seen any such miracle testimony earlier? Correct. Peter and John in Acts chapter 3. Three. So, yes. Uh, so there, Peter, what was the classic uh, statement Peter made? He looked gold and, uh, gold and silver. I don't have, but you know what we have, we give to you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Okay. And faith in his name, it gave him strength. That lame man, how many years was he lame? 40. 40 years. Okay. Lame for 40 years. And he rose up and he started uh, walking, leaping, rejoicing. That's when they were imprisoned, Peter and John. So now something very similar. But this time it's not Peter and John. It's Paul and Barnabas. So you see, the work of the Holy Spirit is continuing through his people. Names have changed, but miracles are continuing. So there is a crippled man. And it says from his mother's womb. Now, we don't know whether he was 40 years old, 30 years old, but from his mother's womb, he was crippled. Paul was preaching. And notice, Paul, uh, it says in verse 9, this man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently and seeing that he had faith to be healed, verse 10, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now, when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. A few things for us to understand here. Paul is preaching the word. When we are preaching the word, what is supposed to happen? Faith is supposed to rise up in the hearts of the people. How will faith come? Faith will come by the word of God. So that is why it's important for us to preach the genuine, un, um, uh, you know, uh, un, you could say incorruptible, undiluted word of God. Because faith will come from there only. If we are not preaching the word, there can faith cannot come. So they were preaching the word. They were preaching the truth of the gospel. That is why Paul, when he is speaking in verse 9, he observed that uh, this man, this lame man had faith to be healed. So maybe a sense of discernment Paul had that this person has listened to the sermon and faith is rising up in his heart. When faith increases, what can we receive? Miracles, answers, healing, right? All the provision that has been made for us. So when Paul noticed that this man was listening to the sermon, faith is increasing, he felt that this is the time, this is the chance. Let's go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, minister a supernatural uh, miracle for this person. And so he says with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet, just like Peter. Rise up, stand up straight on your feet. And the miracle actually happened. Okay. So the miracle would not have happened if there was no faith. But in this case, there is faith. You got it. So this is a lesson for us. That is why the preaching of the word must be such that it gives faith to people. If what we preach will not grow faith in them, then miracles can't happen. Okay. So he was preaching. There was faith that was rising up. And so he commanded and this man was healed or he received a miracle. Now let's move on. What was the response of the people now? What does it say? Verse 11. 
Right, right. So did we did we observe any such response earlier? It's very similar to Acts 3. Even in Acts 3, when the lame man was healed, people started looking at Peter. Earlier he said, look intently at me to the beggar. Later he says, why do you look at us? As if this miracle was done by us. It was done, you know, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So he gives glory to God. Even now when a miracle takes place, so what is the tendency of people when miracles take place? Yeah, they tend to look at the people whom God is using as, you know, superhuman, something great, something, you know, like so big. Same thing is happening. The, Lyco, the people in Lystra are in fact saying these are gods. So that's the kind of respect. So when we are in the supernatural ministry, sometimes people may have the tendency to put us on a pedestal. Okay, but we must always point them to Jesus Christ and say that he alone uh, deserves the glory and all the worship. Peter and John were faithful to do that. Let's see what Paul and Barnabas do. So right now the people are considering them as uh, gods and they are calling Barnabas as Zeus and Paul as Hermes. So there were two gods in uh, their mythology who would, you know, they, ha they had this concept that the gods would show up on the earth every now and then. So that's why they thought, okay, now the gods have come, they've become humans. And Hermes is the one who was the speaker among both of these gods. And because Paul was talking, they called him as Hermes. And there was also a worship that was going on to these gods. And there was a priest of Zeus who was around and they call that priest and this priest brought oxen and garlands to the gates intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. So what is the job of the priest? Worship. Now that the gods have come, they were very um, eager to offer sacrifices to these gods. So the priest of Zeus has come, he is ready with oxen and garlands, okay? But Paul and Barnabas, just like Peter and John, it says, in fact, they, they tore their clothes. What is tearing your clothes? Grief. Yeah, grief. We see this kind of expression of grief in the Old Testament. People used to put on sackcloth, like repentance, or tear their clothes. That is a way of saying uh, that, you know, we are, we are uh, so sad, we are so upset. We are grieving. So they tore their clothes at the actions of the people. And they said to them, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men with the same nature as you. And preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all things that are in them who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely restrain the multitude from sacrificing to them. So what are they doing? First is they are stopping the people from worshipping them. And they're talking about a living God. See, they're always preaching Christ in that context. These people did not understand the meaning of living God. So that is why now Paul is saying, no, have you not heard of the living God? Don't be sacrificing to people and, you know, so-called uh, gods. Instead, worship the true and living God. And just for them to understand, you know, he also uh, describes who this God is. He describes him as a creator. Maybe they didn't have the understanding of God as a creator. They are thinking, you know, some humans, uh, God has come as humans, all kinds of concepts. But he's proclaiming the attributes of God for them to understand a few things. He says, look, God is a creator. He is the one. He has created the heaven, 
the earth, the sea, and all the things in them. And then he also goes on to show them that God is a good God. Right? God is a good God. So what is God like? He is good. He gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So he's trying to tell them, look, all the goodness that we enjoy and experience, it's not coming from nowhere. There is a God. He is a creator. He is good. He is the one who is supplying. Because maybe they were worshipping other things, saying, yeah, all this blessing is coming from somebody else. But he's trying to tell them, no, there is a living God. Everything is coming from him and we should worship them. But even after preaching so much, he could not stop the people from sacrificing. So they went ahead and they sacrificed to Paul and Barnabas. So by the time all of this is happening, there are people or Jews from the earlier two cities. Which are the two cities? Huh. Perga, we didn't hear much uh, ministry over here. <laughs> Look at your Bible. They, they finished two cities and came to Lystra. No, who are which are the two cities? Iconium, very good. Just before that? Antioch, correct. So Jews from Antioch and Iconium have come here also. And they are trying to convince the multitudes that something is wrong with Paul, Barnabas, their teaching. So they take action. What is this action? They stone him. They stone him and drag him out of the city, supposing to be dead. So usually what they would do is they would punish someone who has made a mistake uh, by stoning. And they would stone so much that people would die. Okay, And once the person was dead, they would drag them out of the city. So right now, <coughs> they stone Paul. Uh, we don't know where Barnabas is in this whole picture by, uh, by now. But uh, Paul was stoned and he was dragged out of outside the city thinking that he was dead. So what condition was Paul's body in? If they dragged him out of the city. Unconscious. Unconscious. Yeah, they thought he was dead. Now we don't know whether he was actually dead or not dead. Not very clear. Okay, not very clear. But since Luke says they uh, thought he was dead, uh, maybe he was not dead. He was very badly bruised. Okay. How much time would it take for a person who's very badly bruised to recover? For three, four months. Okay. All the doctors have given their reports. Uh, three, four months. Okay, fine. So let's see how long it takes for Paul to recover. Verse 20. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day, he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Can you imagine? Next day, Paul is on next flight. <laughs> Go to Derby for ministry. He finished his ministry in Lystra. He's going to Derby. Next day, he was badly beaten as if he was dead. But what made the difference? Yes. Disciples gathered around him simply means they prayed. See, whenever there is prayer, did we, did we see prayer deliver anyone earlier? Peter, Peter from the prison. God sent an angel and delivered him. Why? Church prayed. So when there is persecution, when we pray, God delivers. When people are injured, when people are sick, when we pray, God heals. So wonderful, so miraculous. It's unbelievable. How is it possible that a man who was badly beaten, people are only gathering around him, they are praying. He just, it's so easily it says, he rose up. Okay, so it just very easily says he rose up. So that's a miracle. Two amazing miracles in Lystra. 
one is the healing or, or the um, the miracle of a crippled man being made well he was able to walk second is paul recovering from a stoning instantly these are the two miracles okay and they move on to the third city now and in the third city once again you know they do their ministry they are uh, making many disciples it doesn't describe all the all the activities that went on in derby but they finish their preaching and then it says they return back to lystra remember the picture from derby back to lystra back to iconium back to antioch why did they go to these places again yeah how are the churches doing how are the disciples doing and also in order to strengthen them strengthen them with what yes preaching of the word spiritually because maybe there were certain truths that they uh, did not grasp yet so preaching of the word some new subjects you know topics they would have uh, shared with them prayed with them imparted gifts of the holy spirit so there are many ways of spiritually strengthening them and uh, maybe certain practical things also emotional support lot of lot of um, help is required when a church is growing it's not so easy you just, just don't you know sometimes we plant a, a, a plant and then you just say ha okay it will grow right but it doesn't really make it well it may grow for some time but it will not thrive and so in the same way when we think about planting of uh, fellowships of believers or churches care is required nurturing is required strengthening is required and which is why paul and barnabas went back and they were doing these things so they were strengthening the souls of the disciples exhorting them to continue in the faith and um, uh, he, they also told them in verse 22 it says we must through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of god we must go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of god why do you think they made a statement like this paul yes paul is already going through barnabas yeah barnabas is also facing opposition yes and recently uh, in the church of jerusalem also they had um you know persecution but in the places where these believers were we can imagine opposition there was already opposition so the opposition is continuing so in the midst of that opposition they are just encouraging them and they are saying look nothing is happening which is abnormal there will be tribulations there will be trials so for believers trials tribulations persecutions this happens jesus never promised that we will not face these things <laughs> it's continuing even now that's true yeah so wherever the uh, when we believe these things are there we we should not go looking for them but uh, it happens it happens yes okay so they strengthened then they uh, encouraged them and told them these are normal things that happen to believers you know tri tribulations persecutions now one more thing that they are doing in these churches very important verse 23 it says they had appointed elders in every church elders in every church so what what does this teach us yes order governance same like the church of jerusalem there were there were first apostles were there right initially you could even say it was a one man show peter was the person in charge slowly peter and john then slowly you hear like a james you know and uh, names of other apostles and then barnabas elders a lot of people have risen up as elders and leaders and there are also volunteers okay so this is church government slowly it's changing it's shifting and uh, as we go further when paul uh, writes to timothy he'll write about the bishop 
right bishop or the pastor of the church so there are uh, there are all these responsibilities that are given to people in order to um, support the church in order to lead the church the way god intended so it's important for church to have leaders elders and i remember telling in the last class the more the pillars the stronger the building so the more the good leaders in a church the better for the church so that's what they are doing and um, uh, it's it's actually very intelligent and uh, smart of them to do this and they're doing this early if you notice it's not like okay paul and barnabas are doing the ministry for a long time after which they select elders no they are selecting quite early the reason is they know that they may or may not be able to keep coming back to these places so if they are not there who will do the work somebody has to be equipped right so there are elders who have been appointed so they appoint the elders and they pray they fast they commend the churches to the lord that simply means commit commit the churches and uh, bless the churches so that they continue to grow so this is the kind of ministry that's taking place in that return derby iconium derby lystra iconium antioch okay so now that they have passed through it just talks about the directions so verse 24 25 are the direction so coming back to antioch from antioch to it says uh, pamphylia and they go to perga and also to a place called atalia we've seen it it's already there in the map so they go to atalia and from there they sail straight back to antioch from where they had originally originally been sent to do the work of god now they come back to the church and what do they do from verse 27 and 28 could someone read that please Acts 14, verse 27, 28. And when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door for of faith to the Gentiles. Mm. So they stayed there a long time with yes. the disciples. Okay. So um, there is a sense of accountability to the church where they belong. Now, these are traveling ministers. Paul and Barnabas. But as traveling ministers, you know, they could have, they could have thought that uh, we don't have to answer anyone or we don't have to keep anybody updated. You know, they could have had that mindset. But no. Look at them. They are accountable to their home church. Which is their home church? Antioch of, say the full, uh, Antioch of Syria. So they are accountable and it says they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they are accountable to the church. What is being accountable? Yeah, they are submitting on the community that God has made them a part of. Uh, they respect it. They honor it. It's not like, yeah, we went, we did all the ministry, we'll do whatever we want. There, there is no sense of belonging to a particular home church or a, uh, a body of believers. But with the apostles, you always see that. Even when we uh, uh, consider people like Peter and all, they are accountable to the church of Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas, they are accountable to the church of Antioch and they are accountable to the church of Jerusalem because church of Jerusalem is the like the parent body, parent body. So uh, it's, it's good. These are all uh, important things for us to learn. Otherwise, what happens like in today's world, we may we may think that, yeah, I'm not I, I don't go to any church. Sometimes certain traveling ministers are not part of any church. They don't attend church because they are traveling, they are doing ministry work, which is fine, which is fine. But some community or body that one belongs to where they are accountable, 
is always important and necessary. So uh, that is something we have to learn and we can follow that also to stay connected and stay accountable to a church family. Okay. Um, yes. So here at APC also we follow that. Um, you would have noticed most of the time if we have missions trips and all, we generally have it during the week. We hardly miss a Sunday. So we are mostly back, like Saturday we are back, so that on Sunday we are in church. Sometimes it happens that we are ministering in some other church on a Sunday, but it's a one-off. So whenever that happens, you know, we've rostered someone else beforehand and all, but those are rare uh, occasions. In general, even if we are out, we are back before the Sunday. So... Uh, it's good. It's good to stay connected. It's good to stay accountable. So any questions on what we have learned so far today in Acts chapter 14? This is the end of the first missionary journey. So missionary journey starts at Antioch, completed at Antioch, like one, one circle. So now we've completed the first missionary journey. Okay. Um, so if there are no questions. We can stop here and pick up from second missionary journey in the next class. Any practical questions, anything? Okay. All right, so nothing as of now. So we will pray and close for today. Um, I want to request someone from the online batch to please go ahead and pray. Who would like to pray online? Pastor, can I pray? Pastor, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this time, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for all that you've been teaching us, Father God. Father, even as we hear, Lord God, from your word, Lord God, your, how your work has been done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray, Lord God, that you will write in our hearts, Lord God, what you have for us, oh God, the plans that you have for us, oh God, the purposes that you have for each and every one of us, oh God. Father, teach us, oh God, help us, oh God, and help us to obey to the Holy Spirit, oh God, whenever you guide us, oh God, whenever you prompt us, whenever you gently not just oh god and when you convict us father god help each of us lord god to obey lord god to your word oh god and stand as your witnesses lord god sharing the good news of this gospel oh god as a community father god just like the early church did father god father they just glorify you father god help each of us lord god to do our part oh god in sharing this good news lord god and live the way that you've called us to live to make a difference father god thank you lord that you will enable us equip us oh god and you will help us to be the difference, to be the salt and the light. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Jackin. And uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Please read through Acts chapter 15. Very important chapter. So that's why I'm not getting into it. Please read it and come. And then we will uh, study from it. Thank you. All right.